name is Dan Ferguson. I'm a writer, and my assignment was to explore one of the nation's leading research centers and show the effect of the work done there on the life of every American. It was a job that took me through the rolling hills of northeastern Ohio to a striking modern building with the timeless air of an ancient Egyptian temple. The B.F. Goodrich Research Center at Brexville, Ohio. As I got out of my car and started toward the entrance, an ironic thought hit me. Here I was, going into the research headquarters of one of the leading rubber companies in the world. But I knew I'd find the answer before I left this place. The vice and I quickly realized that in addition to being a scientist of note, he was the sort of fellow you'd like to have along on a fishing trip. Well, Mr. Ferguson, you've got yourself quite an assignment. What can I do to help? Doctor, I'm here to uncover some of your man-made scientific miracles. Having dodged chemistry and physics in school, I'm a babe in the scientific woods if ever there was one. Good. We can count on your having an open mind then. Very open, and at the moment, very empty. <laughs> at least of an idea of how to start my story. Well, you might start with the definition of research itself. A friend of mine had a very good one. He said, research is simply an expression of ignorance. It means we don't know. Our job here is to find out. Doctor, first of all, let me say how impressed I was to learn how important rubber really is in our lives. I read where we use 19 pounds of rubber per person in the United States each year, whereas the average for the rest of the world is only about a pound. That's right. And here's another point, perhaps even more important. It's a mighty sobering thought, but if it hadn't been for what you hold in your hand, we might have lost our national neck in World War II. Synthetic rubber? Precisely. The battle to make man-made rubber was the greatest example of industrial teamwork in our nation's history. If that battle hadn't been won, it would have been stopped cold. Our war machine, our entire transportation system couldn't have functioned. The background of that battle was an example of our way of life at its working best. A man really fired with the importance of his subject can cast a kind of spell. And as I sat there listening to the doctor's words, the story he was telling took form before my very eyes. For years before World War II, B.F. Goodrich had been experimenting with the development of several types of man-made rubber. By 1940, general purpose man-made rubber was being turned out at a plant in Akron, Ohio. But this production, important as it was, was just a molehill alongside the 650,000 long tons of rubber the nation used in 1941. Almost all of that, 97%, came from the Far East, over an ocean lifeline 10,000 miles long. Japan knew this. She smashed Pearl Harbor, crippling our fleet. The enemy's goal was the rubber lands, and she got them in a few short weeks. The rubber ships stopped coming. We had rubber, but the hungry war machine was gobbling it up. Not only our war effort, but our very survival as a nation was in the balance, as Uncle Sam faced the most critical period of his life. From Washington went out an SOS, an industry answer. The men in rubber, in petroleum, and in chemicals formed a combat team to fight the battle for man-made rubber. It was a battle we had to win or else lose wars on two fronts and at home. Only 20 months after Pearl Harbor, the B.F. Goodrich Company built at Port Neches, Texas, the world's largest plant for making man-made rubber. And other plants were popping up all over America. With the rubber we needed, our war machine went into high gear. And we struck back all over the globe. And we kept on striking back till the job was done. There were plenty of moments when we didn't know if we'd make it on time. After the war, of course, man-made rubber went right on working for us. People had been waiting impatiently for new cars, refrigerators, tires, and all the many things impossible to get during the war. Without American-made rubber, 
The changeover from war to peace would have taken years longer and cost the people hundreds of millions in higher prices for rubber products. Doctor, I see what you mean. There certainly is a real story here in my hand. But my next question is, how did you do it? Well, you might say the answer to that is right here. Because a good deal of our development of man-made rubber grew out of our work with this material. Looks sort of like leather. It's never been near a cow. It came right out of test tubes and retorts. It's absolutely unknown in nature. Just what is it? It's coroseal, a flexible polyvinyl material. You might call it a kind of cousin to rubber. Their molecular structures are closely related. Well, come along, let's get over to the laboratory. Perhaps we can show you what I mean. I'll be right with you. As soon as we stepped inside one of those laboratories, modern, trim, magnificently equipped, I knew I had another angle for my story. There are those who say there's no frontier left in America. Well, they could be those who've never crossed the threshold of one of these workshops of science, where men and women dedicated to conquest of the unknown work with retorts and test tubes and beakers to convert the dreams of yesterday to the reality of tomorrow. Max is going to help us. Thank you, uh -huh. Max. Now here, as you see, are the basic liquid forms of tree rubber, man-made rubber, and of the polyvinyl material I showed you, which we call Geon. From this basic material, Geon, Coroseal products are made. It looks like milk. Now, it is similar in one respect. Max will show us. If you add vinegar to milk, it sours and thickens. If you add certain acids to these compounds, well, you'll see. Depending on the latex you use, you get crude rubber. I understood you to say your development of man-made rubber was largely of your work with polyvinyl materials. That's right. Most of our visitors have the same basic questions about these products. Come along. I'll show you some of the answers. You'll find a good deal of the information you want in this film. Form hydrogen chloride. Coke and limestone are combined to form acetylene. These two gases are then combined in turn, heated, compressed, and cooled, and thus converted to liquid form. The result, vinyl chloride. A single drop contains literally billions of molecules in a seething, chaotic world of their own. The addition of a catalyst to vinyl chloride works a startling change. The catalyst, like a top sergeant who never joins the rookie ranks, still gets plenty of action. All right, you guys, fall in on the double. Crash it up. The effect of the catalyst makes these molecules grow and hook together in long, strong chains. This bonding reaction is known as polymerization. It gives rubber and plastics their resilience and toughness their ability to stretch and return. In this case, the process of polymerization results in the material polyvinyl chloride. This material is plenty tough, but of no practical use until a plasticizer is added. The plasticizer's softening influence makes these tough little characters pliable and workable. From these processes were formed new materials. These materials brought into being new plants, new jobs, and a vast array of new products which contribute to the safety, the comfort, and the beauty of our daily lives. It was the knowledge we gained in our work with polyvinyl materials that made it simpler to further develop their chemical cousin, man-made rubber and an industrial team of scientists, development engineers, and production specialists is constantly at work putting rubber and many other materials into thousands of constructive services for mankind. 
The teamwork has brought improvement in plasma and surgical tubing, oxygen masks, water bottles, and many other items indispensable in surgery and the sick room. Surgeons' gloves today are tissue thin, but almost unbelievably strong. Millions of feet of lightweight, high-pressure hose are in our first line of defense against fire. Conveyor belts of tough, lasting rubber are constantly at work in the nation's factories, quarries, docks, and mills, increasing output and providing rapid, low-cost handling of raw and finished materials. Even people ride conveyor belts today. The world's first rubber sidewalk carries a million people every year in the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. Without rubber, much of the nation's oil reserves would remain sealed in the earth. A rotary drilling hose helps bring oil to the surface by lubricating cutting tools while defying pressures up to 5,000 pounds per square inch. And V-belts flex tough rubber muscles to keep heavy pumping equipment at work. A five-inch section of rubber lifts an automobile. It is cemented to a steel hoist with an amazing adhesive called Plastilock, another achievement of research and engineering. Sportsmen throughout the world wear rubber footwear for safety and comfort. And the thermos an insulated rubber boot that was first worn on Korean battlefronts was developed by B.F. Goodrich for our fighting men. It protects against frostbite at temperatures as low as 45 degrees below zero. Rubber footwear for sports and informal wear are familiar products to us all. Airplane de-icers invented by B.F. Goodrich in 1930 have made a notable contribution to the progress of commercial and military aviation enabling planes to fly in spite of severe icing conditions. Yes, there are literally thousands of products made from rubber and rubber-like materials in use today. And still over 70% of all rubber used in this country goes into tires and other transportation products. Tires of all types are designed with as much care as a bridge or a battleship, using more than 200 materials in addition to rubber. Over 40 million passenger cars ride the nation's highways with the speed, the comfort, and the safety only pneumatic tires can provide. And as the ultimate in safety, there is the tubeless tire, invented by B.F. Goodrich, a dream of tire makers for 50 years. Demonstrating the great strength of the Lifesaver tubeless tire, this guillotine-like machine rises to a height of 40 feet and drops with a static load of 2,600 pounds onto the tire. And after months of such punishment, this tubeless tire is still going strong. In another test, even after hundreds of punctures, the air pressure in the Lifesaver tubeless tire is retained by a lining of man-made rubber, which seals holes made by nails or other sharp objects. And of course, it is not only passenger tires which have known tremendous improvements through the years. Longer lasting, tougher rubber and fabrics mean more service from heavy duty tires used by the nation's vital trucking industry. Better tires on agricultural equipment are helping to raise production of farms and ranches from coast to coast. Giant tires cushion earth moving juggernauts that literally can move mountains and jet planes of our armed forces land safely at tremendous speed on airstrips or carrier decks, thanks to aircraft tires made specially to withstand the tremendous shock. And as with tires, so with a vast number of other products of the rubber industry, the story is one of unending progress in research, in development, and in production, the work goes on seeking new ways to put to use those modern miracles of science, polyvinyl flexible materials, and man-made rubber. Well, thank you, Frank. Did you find enough ideas to get a start on your story? If I ever had any doubts about the importance of research, you've taken care of them once and for all. Good. Well, there's one thing I can't impress on you too strongly. We're still only on the threshold in almost every scientific field. It's tremendously important that our young people should realize that fact. 
After all, our colleges and universities can give them the very best of scientific education. American industry can make available to them the finest scientific equipment in the world. But ultimately, every young man and young woman must make his own decision. So see if you can't light even more fires of scientific enthusiasm in our young people. Remind them that in the research scientist of tomorrow lies our real hope, perhaps our very survival as a nation. Don't worry, Doctor. That'll be in the story and let us that hard. Thank you, sir. You've been most helpful. It's my pleasure. Oh, I almost forgot. There was one final question. Yeah? It's so simple, I feel a little foolish asking it. Oh, what is it? When I came in the building, there was a youngster there with a ball, and... Tell me, Doctor, what makes a ball bounce? Well, we've learned how to make a plane fly faster than sound. We've learned to create new products and materials. Some of us have even split the atom, but there's one thing. <laughs> Do me a favor. If you find out, let me know. That's a deal. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.